One day you will look back and all you will see is magic. That's a quote I read several years ago and it really resonated with me, even though I wasn't really sure why at the time. It's easy to think that our path in life is random. Numerous unrelated events, decisions, people that propel us forward. And most people tend to think of life's defining moments as epic events. Now, I've had a lot of epic events. I've been chased by elephants in the forest in Congo. I've survived a plane crash. And I have been charged by dozens of gorillas in the wild. <laughs> Nothing propels you forward like being charged by a gorilla. <laughs> But while these events were epic, they weren't my defining moments. In fact, I think that life's most important and defining moments sometimes show up as soft whispers. The first time I heard that whisper, I was in the parking lot of Joe Robbie Stadium in bike shorts and a sports bra, and I was getting ready to audition to be a Miami Dolphins cheerleader. I did not actually really want to be a cheerleader. I loved football, and I wanted front row seats to all the games, especially during the Marino and Shula years. I walked into the stadium, and I saw all these gorgeous, tall, beautiful women with their legs past their heads, and I spun around and I walked right back out. And I made it all the way back to my car, and then I heard the whisper. I was afraid of being rejected. I didn't think I had what it took. I mean, I hadn't even made my high school team, actually, when I tried out for them. And then I thought, I'm cutting myself from the opportunity, from the squad. And so I turned right back around, I walked in past the statuesque models, and I took a number, and I tried to kick my leg over my head as best I could. I made the team. <laughs> I was a cheerleader for four years while I was a pre-law student at the University of Miami. And in my junior year, I had to take one last science requirement, and I wanted to take a women's biology class, but it was full. I begged and pleaded with this professor to please let me in, and to no avail. So I randomly selected an anthropology class simply because it fit my schedule. This decision would change my entire life. It was during that class that I started learning about all of these beautiful and amazing primates, most of which had never even been studied. And then I watched Gorillas in the Mist, and I had this aha moment. I knew right then and there that that is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Here's the thing. You can go ahead and laugh at my mom's hair. I knew you wanted to. <laughs> I was a total girly girl, as evidenced by the snow white dress that my grandmother made for me. I was the only daughter of Cuban immigrants, incredibly overprotective. When I asked my mom if I could join the Girl Scouts, she said, absolutely not, that is way too dangerous. <laughs> and then I finally got the grant, and I told my mom that I was leaving. She begged and she cried for me not to go but I knew she still supported me because she ironed all my field clothes. For my first expedition, I headed to Guyana, to one of the most remote and unexplored regions of the Amazon. I wanted to study a very little-known monkey, the white-faced Saki. I was completely ill-prepared. I had never left the country. I took a dry-clean-only little Calvin Klein vest, and all I had with me was a backpack and a little notebook, but the most amazing feeling, the feeling of possibility. 
I spent several months living out of this dugout canoe, and everything was going great. In fact, I called my mom at some point and said, see, see, I could do it. And then I almost died. And it was while I was lying in a hospital bed in Guyana from a very mysterious uh, blood infection that I saw this article in Time magazine. And the title really captured my intention, Death Row. And it talked about the 25 most endangered primates in the world. And I noticed that there were 23 stunning photographs, but then there were these two line drawings. There were no photographs of these animals in existence. They're lemurs. And so off I went to the enchanted island of Madagascar, the only place in the world where lemurs are found. I searched those jungles for months and months and couldn't find them. I had been told that it was actually going to be impossible to do. We endured monsoons, endless stings and bites. I even got cholera. Still couldn't find them. And then one day, I got this, a glimpse of one. First photograph of this animal ever taken. And it was running away. But the whisper said, don't give up. And so I kept pushing. And eventually, we found a group of these lemurs. And I was able to study them for months and collect the first investigation of these animals, which then actually led to them being full species rather than just mere subspecies. National Geographic became very interested in my work, and they came to Madagascar to shoot a documentary on it. They then offered me a job as their first female and first Hispanic wildlife correspondent. Thank you. I was ecstatic, but I was still a graduate student, and my professors were not as thrilled. They thought this was a terrible idea. I wouldn't be taken seriously in academia. And they thought I was basically selling out. I mean, this move really had the potential to end my academic career. I took the job anyway. For the last two decades, I've been a National Geographic explorer, conducting research all over the world, filming, and giving lectures globally. Now, the opportunity to have this television platform I knew it was going to be really important because I could cover pertinent issues and hopefully inspire people to care more about our planet. And I got to work with animals that I'd only dreamt of seeing in the wild. And it was also an opportunity to be a woman at the televisual forefront, waist deep in swamps, getting charged by gorillas, things that we normally see khaki-clad men doing. For my first assignment, National Geographic wanted me to climb on this expedition, South America's tallest tapui, Mount Roraima. Now, here's the thing. Tapuis are these giant land formations that resemble islands in the sky. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle coined them the lost world. It would require world-class climbing skills. Dozens of other explorers had attempted this and failed. They asked me if I'd ever been climbing before. I'm from Florida. I'd, I'd only been to Orlando and thought the landfills were mountains. I was sleeping literally above the clouds on hanging tents with a three-foot ledge and a precipitous drop of 10,000 feet below us. But here's the truth. I was terrified of heights. And so my colleague at the time uh, thought it would be really funny on the first night when I'd finally gone to sleep in this hanging tent to shake my tent. Yeah, we miss him. <laughs> but I did this not because I'm an adrenaline junkie. I did it because of the possibility of discovery. And that I'm wearing on my back is a plant press. We collected hundreds of plants that were then later analyzed by the Smithsonian. As a result of this expedition, we named five new different species of frogs. 
it was an amazing opportunity that if I hadn't taken, even though I'd never been climbing, and even though I'm terrified of heights, I would regret for the rest of my life. So I've taken a lot of risks throughout my career, and not just physical ones. I was, uh, three years ago, asked to join uh, this team as the expert scientist to explore the legend of Bigfoot. Most scientists really frown upon that. And I knew that there would be a very large risk in doing this. And in fact, while most of the feedback has been positive, I did face a lot of harsh criticism, particularly from other scientists. So I decided to phone a friend. Uh, you may have heard of her, Dr. Jane Goodall. Like me, Jane faced a lot of criticism in the beginning of her career for going against mainstream science. She decided to name the chimps instead of number them. And like me, she sees the value of exploration. She agrees that curiosity and wonder is at the very heart of science. And she understands that science cannot explore closed doors. And like Jane, I've also had to fight that stereotype. You know, in the beginning of my career in this male-dominated field, as many women do, I started to play down my femininity. I started to dress a little bit more masculine, and it never felt authentic. So then I decided, I'm just not going to hide it. I'm going to flaunt it, right? So I started dressing the way I want. I curled my hair. I started sporting pink boots. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so this is the reason why. For the last two decades, the media has been calling me the female Indiana Jones. So when I finally had the chance to have dinner with Harrison Ford, I said, just for tonight, I'm only going to refer to you as the male Dr. Maria Mayer. <laughs> Now, on a personal note, I had always wanted kids. And like many women in academia, you're kind of encouraged to either delay that or skip it altogether. And I really wondered if I could balance this career and have children. I had also never met my dad. So I kind of wanted the whole package. Could I have it all? And nine months into wondering that, my first daughter was born. And because I grew up as an only child, and I wanted her to have a sibling, uh, we had our second child. But I'd always wanted to have a little boy, so I thought, I'm going to try one more time. And I got pregnant, and we got twin girls. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got my boy, and then another little girl for good measure. <laughs> So this is what my wild tribe looks like. Now, is it difficult? Yeah. <laughs> Does it take an extended family? Absolutely. But I wouldn't change the thing. And the thing is, is I run my life very much like I do my expedition, so I'm really good at logistics. While I have kids, I'm still going out on these expeditions, and on this particular one in northeastern Madagascar, something happened that scientists only dream of. We suspected that we had discovered a brand new species to science. I had to go back to Madagascar to confirm it. Sounds easy enough, but this is a nocturnal primate, so it only comes out at night. It is a mouse lemur, so it's not your average lemur. It is the smallest in the world. So imagine looking for that in the forest at night and during monsoons. We finally found them. We were able to collect blood samples, take measurements, weights. It weighs less than two ounces. This little creature fits in the palm of your hand. We took all sorts of descriptive notes, but I wanted to do more. I wanted it to really mean something. So then I went and met with the president and prime minister of Madagascar and convinced them to declare the area a national park. I wanted you to see it up close, and no, I'm not squeezing it too hard. 
That's what a lemur on drugs looks like. But this tiny little creature became a huge ambassador for all things wild in Madagascar and helped protect the thousands of other species that shared that same rainforest. Something I recently realized is that I've spent my entire career searching for the seemingly impossible to find. But I'd actually had always been searching for my dad my entire life. And I had just about given up. And three months ago, I found him. And I was thrilled, and I was terrified. Because what if he didn't want to meet me? And the very next morning, I showed up at his door unannounced, and I knocked on the door, and I'm really happy to say that he's actually here tonight. The unknown is scary. And sometimes the unknown is a place or a person or the bottom of an underground cave. But for me, what I've realized is, is that the thing I fear most in life is having regret. The idea of not doing something and, and missing out on that. So fear is not limiting to me. It actually propels me. And my whispers have come in the most unusual of places. The parking lot of a football field, a hospital bed in Guyana, a dark classroom. But all of these unusual places had one thing in common. Life asked me to take the risk despite the fear and to not give up. And so if I have one wish for you tonight, it's that you push past your fears, that you listen to your own whisper. Let your dream be your compass. And if you do, one day you will look back and all you will see is magic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.